My name is Buddy Childress. I am Executive Director of Needles Eye Ministries, and on behalf of our team and board, we really appreciate you being here. Thanks for coming today. Just a couple of short announcements before I introduce our speaker. Um, the main announcement, really, is that this luncheon is being sponsored by Ministry Resource. And their president and CEO, Mark Towell, is here. Mark, we so appreciate this. Where are you seated? Please stand. Thank you so much for sponsoring. <laughs> Ministry Resource has been with us a long time. We really appreciate them. So thanks again, man. Um, now, I want to encourage all of you over the next few weeks to go on our website. Uh, we have some ex what we think will be some exciting things that will be happening in the next six months. And the reason I say the next six months is that is because that's the last half of our 40th year of ministry, which is what we are currently in. So we haven't set things in stone yet relative to, to days and whatnot, but we will be doing that. So continue to check our website out over the next month and you'll see some exciting things. Um, also, there will be a follow-up from our luncheon today with Jordan Maroon, and it will be on December the 20th. When I call your attention to the card later before we leave, if you're interested in that follow-up, that's the date. We haven't set the time yet, so please let us know if you're interested in that, and I'll, and I'll remind you of this again. And also, as we go through the next couple of minutes, if you would, the card that is at your table, or at your place on your table, and there's some pins at the, in the middle, begin to fill the top part of that out, and then I'll bring you back to the bottom part, part later. Um, lastly, if you have a cell phone, please mute it, we would appreciate that. And also on the back of that card, so it, is, it wasn't lastly, this is lastly, on the back of the card there's a space to write some questions down, we'll be doing some Q&A after Jordan speaks. So thank you for listening to those announcements. We're really appreciative of you being here. And now it is my treat to introduce our speaker today, Jordan Maroon. Jordan grew up at Stony... Yeah, who was clapping? I love this. You know, I'm really struggling because I could tell some little stories on him. Uh, he's only been with us, what, eight months? Yeah. But I'm going to reserve those for a later time, with maybe one exception. But we'll see. Um, Jordan grew up at Stony Point Presbyterian Church here in Richmond, and he graduated from Christopher Newport. And he has a, a major in political science, which is a wonderful degree. And he has a minor in leadership studies from CNU. He began his professional career at Wake Forest University as a, a staff member for InterVarsity uh, Christian Fellowship. Then trans, I guess you could say transferred beyond Wake Forest and went to Chapel Hill. And he was the director of the InterVarsity ministry on the campus of, Chapel, of UNC Chapel Hill. But additionally, he was president of Evangelical Campus Ministries at UNC. And that consisted of 60 different campus ministers that were together, Evangelical Campus Ministers and Ministries. And he, he headed that group for a number of years. Um, over the years, Jordan has trained hundreds of men and women as small group leaders, and that was one of the many things that really attracted him to us as we were searching for a new small group coordinator last spring. Um, his, his father, Joe Maroon, uh, is executive director of the Virginia Environmental Endowment. I'm not going to introduce him formally to you, Jordan, we'll do that in a moment. And his, uh, his mom, Anne, uh, teaches French at Westminster Academy. Having had a number of years of French, I am astonished at anyone who teaches that. So congratulations, Anne. <laughs> um, Jordan is married to Crystal. Uh, she also worked within a varsity on, in Greek campus ministry. They have two children, uh, Riley, who is five, and Copeland, who is almost two, and Copeland probably thinks he's almost 10. Um, I will tell you this story. On, you know, everyone has positives and negatives, and, and one of the few negatives that Jordan has <laughs> is that he is a Cleveland Indians fan. I just, it is beyond comprehension as someone who went to school in Boston and who has lived and died with the Red Sox for decades that anyone could be an Indians fan. However, the redemption to that is their manager, Tito Francona, was also the manager for the Red Sox. So I guess that's a wash, right? So having said all of that, most of it important, would you help me welcome our speaker, my colleague, Jordan Maroon. 
Thank you. 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 Thank you.
What, what if nobody realizes that I'm actually serving that much? And then if they do realize it, if they reward us or acknowledge us in some way, what does that mean? Are we really still a servant if we're getting something from it? And how far are we supposed to take it? Are we just supposed to do everything for other people? Or is it okay for us to do anything for ourselves, to take care of ourselves, to try to pursue our own careers? So I'm going to try to get into some of those things, unpack them a little bit. And I'm going to try to do that uh, in three ways. The first thing I'm going to try to do is talk about a historical perspective on servanthood and how that's changed and how that's reflected in modern times. I'm going to give us some ways that I hope will help us assess our motivations in serving and kind of get at what am I really trying to do. And then I'm going to try to end by getting us into the question of identity, the difference between acting like a servant, acting like a servant when you choose to, or being a servant when you don't have a choice. It's just you're at the beck and call of another person at all times. So I'm going to talk a little bit about perspective, motivation, and identity. There's a really well-regarded Georgetown professor of philosophy named Francis Ambrosio, and he says that there are historically two ways to think about a meaningful life. There's the way of the hero and there's the way of the servant, excuse me, the way of the saint. And the way of the hero is what the ancient world valued. The ancient world was all about heroism. That's why the Olympics, they weren't just a competition. They were really kind of a religious ceremony who would elevate to a higher status. And so in the Roman Empire, it was divided between the upper 2% of people, the important people, and everybody else who was just the rabble. And everything in that society reflected status. Everything from how you dressed to the job you did to even kind of the legal code. You know, elites didn't do manual labor. That's something they would never do. And so they wore togas, which covered over one of their hands as a sign of, that is beneath me. I don't don't work with my hands. There were actually separate laws for the rich and the poor. Um, the, The rich could not, yeah, they didn't have the same laws as the poor people. And there were separate punishment punishments. For example, a Roman citizen could not under any circumstances be crucified. That was considered a slave's punishment. It was was beneath them. And so in the ancient world, humility was not a virtue at all. It was actually looked down upon pretty strongly. Aristotle famously described his uh, great-souled man, you may have heard about. And when he describes the great-souled man, this is someone who is extremely arrogant, who is really skilled at talking about all of his achievements, and who despises the commoners. It's this world that's obsessed with status, uh, which is obviously very different from our world, of course. That's not at all reflected today. No, Coach Bennett, when he spoke for us, he talked about how our society says we're actually the ones that should be served. We're entitled to other people doing things for us. And that's what our society is about. We exalt the hero, the celebrity, the important person, the powerful person. Regardless of who you voted for, or even if you admire one or more of these candidates, would you describe Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton as a servant leader? That, that's not really what our, our society elevates. So for many of us in our work, and even in our communities, in our churches, this idea, this biblical idea of dying to yourself and serving has been replaced with be all you can be, move up, move up the corporate ladder, make the most of yourself. But Jesus in Matthew 20 said, whoever wishes to be great among you, whoever wishes to be great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the son of man, he's talking about himself, did not come to serve, but to be served, did not come to be served, but to serve, excuse me, and to give his life as a ransom for many, which is the way of the saint. You know, Jesus famously washed his disciples' feet on the eve of his crucifixion. And that's actually something that Coach Bennett talked about for us. But if you, if you really look at that story, he actually goes a lot further than that. So he takes off his outer garments and he wraps a towel around his waist, which is exactly how a slave would dress. But Jesus chose to dress that way. And he washed their feet, which in that society was a really important ritual. Their feet were pretty, pretty nasty, probably. But that was only done by slaves. And in fact, it was considered so demeaning that a Jewish master couldn't compel his Jewish slave to wash his feet. Only non-Jews wash the feet of Jews. But Jesus, who was a Jew, washed their feet. And we actually don't have a single story from that period of time of a higher status person washing the feet of a lower status person. We don't have a single record of a rabbi ever washing his disciples' feet. But Jesus, who was a rabbi and who was the most important person in history, took on this place and and washed their feet. And eventually he would, you know, soon thereafter, he would become betrayed and arrested and convicted. And then he would be killed by crucifixion, a slave's death. So the God of the universe, the most important person in a society obsessed with elevating yourself and making much of yourself, instead he took on the appearance and the occupation and the legal status and the death of the least important person. 
This was completely unheard of. And after he rose again and he went to heaven, this little community formed of Jesus followers, the church. And one of the first things that happened in the early church is when a slave would walk into a worship service, someone else, someone more important, would stop what they're doing, would wrap a towel around their waist, and get down and wash that slave's feet. This was not normal. In fact, a university in Australia, Macquarie University, recently did a research project because they wanted to understand what happened. Why did humility go from this despised weakness to an admired virtue? And their their conclusion was crystal clear. It was the impact of the Judeo-Christian worldview on Europe. That's why we value humility. It's because of Jesus and his followers. They changed this entire trajectory of that conversation. And a friend of mine, a friend of mine, Willis Weber, who I worked with in InterVarsity, he actually lives in Richmond now but couldn't be with us today. I remember one time, maybe six or seven years ago, we were talking and he told me, when I, Willis, when I started in campus ministry, I thought my job was supposed to be, was to be Paul. You know, Paul wrote most of the New Testament. He founded most of the churches in the Mediterranean. He did all this huge and courageous ministry that we still talk about. But, said Willis, what if I'm not supposed to be Paul? What if I'm supposed to be Barnabas? And if you know Barnabas, Barnabas was Paul's mentor, but then Paul completely overshadowed him. You know, Barnabas is mentioned in the Bible, but how often, you know, does a pastor get up and talk about Barnabas and all the great things he did? And so Willis said, what if I'm not supposed to be Paul? What if I'm supposed to be Barnabas? And what if my students are supposed to be Paul? What if they're supposed to overshadow me? What would that mean? And I, I, uh, I got to be honest, I really wrestled with that question for a long time. You know, my students, uh, my former students have gone on to do a, a bunch of amazing things. Some of them work here in Richmond at places like Blue Sky Fund and Chat. But I had students uh, all over the place, Facebook headquarters. I had a student work in the West Wing of the White House, uh, Microsoft, IBM, doctors, accountants, lawyers, all kinds of things, pastors. But I kind of want to be Paul. I mean, that's why I went into ministry in the first place, right? I wanted to do something significant for God. What if they're the ones that are supposed to be more significant? What does that mean for me? And what I wanted was the way of the hero. I didn't want what Jesus said, which is whoever wishes to be great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. And I don't have time to get into this at the moment, but I think if I look back on my 10 years in campus ministry, when I tried to be Paul, when I tried to be the guy out of a desire to do good things for God, our ministry was significantly less effective. And I can tell you about that more if you ask me later. But is it wrong for us? Is it wrong for us to want to use more of our talents? Is it wrong for us to want to make much of ourselves or even want to get a promotion or make more money so you can support yourself or your family? Well, the Bible gives us kind of a rubric to think about that. It says in Philippians 2 that our attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So Jesus didn't, he didn't grasp that. He didn't cling to the power and the position and the authority that he had and that he deserved. What he did is he laid it down and he took on a very nature of a servant, which is really interesting because, it, you know, this text says he, he obeyed his father. Well, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Father are equal, but Jesus voluntarily made himself beneath the father. He became a servant and he obeyed his father all the way to a slave's death. And the text says, that's what my attitude is supposed to be like. That's what our attitudes are supposed to be like. So is it wrong for us to make much of ourselves? Well, Jesus was a blue collar carpenter and a white collar rabbi. He had followers, he had influence, he had some level of power. And the Bible doesn't say that those things are wrong. What the Bible says is, what's your perspective? Is your perspective that, is your attitude that of Christ Jesus? Are you trying to make much of yourself the way of the hero? Or are you following the way of your saint, the way of the saint? Are you laying down your life? And as I thought about that over the years, and as I thought about that in preparation for today, I tried to come up with, how can we evaluate which one I'm following? Because sometimes I think I'm following the way of the saint, and in retrospect, I really am not. So I came up with a few questions uh, that I use to evaluate my motives, and maybe they'll be helpful for you. Have you ever done... um, Have you ever done something nice for your spouse or your roommate? Like maybe you clean the house or the apartment and you're just doing it to be nice. And then they get home and they don't notice. And now you're kind of ticked off. Wait wait a minute. 
why, why can't you tell what a good husband I am? Why can't you tell me what a good husband I am and then go put on Facebook so that everybody knows what a good husband I am, right? You know, I, I, you don't do it initially for yourself. You do it to be kind, but then you're, when you don't get credit, you're kind of upset. That may or may not be autobiographical. We, we want to do these kind things, but we also kind of want to benefit from them. And that desire to be noticed and to receive recognition is an obvious indicator when we're not doing things from a purely servant's perspective. I do want to love and serve my wife. I do want to love and serve my kids, but I kind of like it when I get credit for it. I do want to serve the folks at Needle's Eye and help the small groups grow and become these wonderful things and, and serve them and listen to them, but I also want them to appreciate me. And that's a way that we can assess our motives. Do I want credit, and am I upset when I don't get any credit? Another question that I use is I ask, who am I serving and why? I think that for most of us, it's at least somewhat easy to do kind and self-sacrificial things for some people, for certain people. The people we like, the people who like us, the people who will appreciate or even admire us if we do these things. Um, maybe even people who will do something nice for us in return. But Jesus in Luke 14, he's attending this party of uh, these big, big religious leaders, and he's just turned to the whole group who's been jockeying for position and status based upon where they're sitting, and he's called them out. He said, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. And so then he turns to the host of the party, and, and by the way, Jesus is not a good party guest. If you, if you don't get that from reading the Gospels, he will call you out, man. Um, and so what he says to the, to the host in front of everybody, he says, when you, when you give a feast... Don't invite all the people who can pay you back. Don't invite all the people you like. Invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. That's the reason you'll be blessed, because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Jesus is saying, you can either get your reward now or later, but you're going to be blessed if you, if you invite the people who can't do anything back for you. So I would ask the question for us, who are those that can't repay us at work? Is it the person that nobody likes? Is it the coworker whose political views just drive you up a wall? Is it the person who talks too much about themselves or who everyone knows is getting fired and they're all kind of distancing themselves from him or her? The overly demanding boss, the overly demanding client? Or maybe it's a wonderful person, a really kind person that's easy to be around, but they're not in a position to pay you back or to do something to further your career. The parking attendant, the janitor, the secretary. You know, Jesus didn't, he didn't try to make much of his own reputation. The Bible talks about a time where he, he goes to this hated tax collector named Zacchaeus, uh, who you may primarily know as a wee little man. But Zacchaeus had some other characteristics. Zacchaeus was hated and despised in the community because he was a cheat and a liar, and he stole tons of money from people. And Jesus, in front of this big crowd, goes, hey, Zacchaeus, I think I'm going to go hang out with you. I'm going to go spend time with you. And now we might think, wow, what a nice guy Jesus is. But at the time, everybody was probably talking amongst themselves, saying, you know, the people in the Bible are always saying, why is Jesus hanging out with tax collectors and sinners? What is he doing with those people? It doesn't score him any points in the community, you know. So who's that person for, for us, for you? Who's the person in your office or in your neighborhood or in your church? What if God is telling you to serve that person specifically because it will not benefit you? specifically because they can't pay you back. So we can check our motives by asking, will doing this for this person benefit me, and is that why I'm doing it? Or is that why I'm unwilling to do it? And I think these things are pretty challenging. They're hard for me, and maybe for many of you, because I'm trying to find at least some of my worth and value in my work. I try to demonstrate to myself and others, even to you today, that you know, I can cut it. I have what it takes. I can hack it. And work for me is a place where I, where I do. I try to prove myself a little bit. But if I'm doing that, how can I really fully be a servant? And I'm not talking about being excellent at our jobs. I mean, that, that is admirable and something we should all pursue. I'm saying thinking of myself as more valuable or less valuable based upon how well I do or what other people think about me. Because if I'm trying to prove myself, then I have to, at least in some way, make much of myself. If I'm trying to prove to you that I'm a good speaker, then I need to do a good job, and then I need you to realize that I'm doing a good job. It's about me, to some degree. Or maybe the complete degree. And so as long as we're finding even part of our worth and our deep identity as human beings, and our value as people in our work and how we're perceived by others and how well we do, it's going to be really hard for us to fully embrace this call to servanthood because we're always going to be serving ourselves at least a little bit. 
So I think that what we have to do is we have to stop thinking of servanthood as something that we can you know, put on or take off. And we have to embrace this call to just be a servant. And I like the feeling of act, uh, I like the feeling of having some of the characteristics of a servant. I, I really like helping people. I like listening and encouraging. I like mentoring. And sometimes I don't even want credit for doing those things. Yeah, I genuinely like doing them. But when I'm done with them, I get to go back to my own life and my own work and my own family. But what would it mean to really be a servant? You know, you wouldn't have that option. You would just your whole life would be based upon what someone else wants. And so I tried to think about what would being a servant in 2016 mean? You know, doing the things that everyone else thinks are beneath them. Things like clipping somebody's toenails, right? In my mind, that was like the modern day equivalent of washing the disciples' feet. You know, doing the things, you know, just you're running around. You, you want to do something for yourself? Nope, you need to pick up their dry cleaning. You thought you were going to have a minute to yourself? No, now you're making their dinner. Acting like a servant when it's convenient, or even when it's not convenient, but you get to choose to do it, that's different than being a servant. And I think it's good that we live in a society where, for the most part, we can pick and choose a career that matches our passions and our education and our talents. It's good that we can provide for ourselves and others. It's even good that, you know, some of us are in positions with a little bit of influence, or maybe you run a company or a division or a team. I think those are good things. But what they do is they allow us to pick and choose when we want to be servant-like. It's a choice. And the ultimate problem is there is one person who deserves my complete allegiance, my complete servitude. There is a master whose every beck and call should dictate my life. And so because it's Christmas, I'm going to wrap up with an example from Luke chapter 1. This is a story you're probably familiar with. This young woman named Mary, she's about 13 or 14 years old. And she's engaged to an older man named Joseph. And in the middle of the night... An angel appears to her and he says, you're going to have a baby and his name is going to be Jesus and he's going to be called the son of the most high. And don't worry about being a virgin. The Holy Spirit's going to take care of that. It'll be fine. And I just, I I imagine that Mary's whole life kind of flashed before her eyes. What what am I going to tell people? What's going to happen to me? People are going to notice that I'm pregnant. What am I going to say? No, 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 guys. It's fine. It was God. It's fine. Everything's fine. You know, they're not going to believe her. And, and her fiancé is going to break off this engagement. In fact, we see a little bit later in that chapter that, that her fiancé actually thinks about doing that. Her family might disown her in this small, tight-knit community that she's in. Everybody's going to know. They're going to gossip about her. They're going to look down on her. And she's going to be a teenage single mom in a society where she has no education, no legal protections, no financial future, and no marriage prospects. This is her life if she says yes to this. So what does she say? She says... Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And that, I mean, that just hits me between the eyes. That's not acting like a servant. That's being a servant. You are my Lord. My life is yours to do with as you please. That's real servanthood. Servanthood is costly. My life is yours to do with as you please. No caveats, no withholdings, no excuses. You're the master, I'm the servant. If you tell me to do it, I go, and I do it. Uh, and I'm using Mary as an example because I'm not a great example of that. But that, that's the way of the saint. That's whoever wishes to be great among you shall be your servant. That's the calling for all the followers of Jesus. And it's, it's really challenging, um, But a thing that might be helpful for us to remember, I think might be really helpful for us to remember, is that none of us started out as servants. This isn't a step down for us. The Bible says in Romans 5 verse 10 that while we were still God's enemies, Jesus died for us. It's easy for me, at least, maybe you too, to think of myself more as one of the disciples. You know, yeah, I'm problematic and I'm hard-headed and unworthy of God, sure, but also I'm genuinely trying to be a good person. And, you know, Jesus kind of benefits from rescuing me, right, because I'm going to do something back for him. This is a pretty good situation for him. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that I was his enemy, that you were his enemies. We were the people that nobody would serve. You know, no, how many of us in our offices are serving the person who fiercely opposes you or undermines you at every opportunity? You know, in that same chapter, it says, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good, for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while we were still his enemies, Christ died for us. So we're not entitled to anything. Contrary to what our culture would say, we have this infinitely merciful God, and he took all of what we, his enemies, deserved. He took it upon himself, and he made this way for us to be his sons and daughters. 
We have a God who left behind everything that he had, his perfect existence in heaven, to come experience all the pain and the suffering and the hardship and the struggle that we experience and to serve, to serve us, to serve his heavenly father. And he calls us, he says, follow me, follow in my footsteps as a servant. It's a privilege to be a servant of a living God. And I think, I hope, if we can have the right perspective, that we think of things and try to follow the way of the saint, if we can check our motives, and if we can not just think of service as something that I do when it's convenient, you know, something I can put on or take off, but if we can really try to as best we can and in the imperfect way we're going to do it, say like Mary said, Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. I think that would glorify God, and I think it would be a huge blessing to the people around us. Thank you very much. As is our custom, we're going to take a few questions, probably two or three, uh, on servanthood, which you've heard today. So, um, and it's usually the case that it just takes one to get the ball rolling. So who will be brave and be our first question asker for George? Brian, do you have your hand up? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to have your hand up? I have a question. Um, you know, you gave some good examples. Toe down. Sure. You know, hey, folks who are maybe in critical care, yeah. in care that would be a great way to think, but in the workplace, yeah. right? Um, can, you, can you give us a couple of other examples you thought of relative to specific acts of serving in the workplace that you think would um, be game changer? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> You don't need to know. Uh, <laughs> one thing that I thought about was, you know, that often we're in situations where we're doing collaborative work, and if you know that somebody else on your team maybe went above and beyond, or even just they could kind of use the credit a little bit more than you, I, I think it's appropriate at times to defer credit. I, I'm not saying to be falsely humble, but, but, you know, if somebody, if I work on something with my coworkers and people come and go, Jordan, you did a great job, it's appropriate for me to, you know, I could take that. Or I could say, actually, just so you know, this was really Lori and Elizabeth. They really pulled the heavy weight, and I did X, Y, and Z. You know, I appreciate you saying that. Um, I think it's thinking about, you know, sometimes if you're ahead of your work, you could jump into a next project, but maybe that project is a little ways off, and it actually would be okay for you not to get around to it until the next day, but you know that there's a coworker who's swamped. Are you willing to go ask them if they need any help? Can you do, you know, that's appropriate in some settings, probably more than others. Uh, and and I, I just think about, personally caring for people as well. You know, there are times where I, I get really, you know, um, kind of tunnel vision. I'm going into work, I'm driving in, I'm thinking about what I'm doing that day. I have a big project ahead of me that I'm excited about or I know is important. And I can just walk straight into my office and go to work and kind of ignore my coworkers. Um, they're, they're pretty, they're more relational than I am, so they help me not do that. But there are times where if I know somebody's got going on, maybe got a lot going on, excuse me, personally or in their family, maybe instead I stop and I take a couple minutes and I go check in with them and see how they're doing and can I listen to them? Can I, if it's appropriate, you know, in my work setting, it might be more appropriate than yours. Maybe I can pray for them. Maybe I can do something kind for them. Maybe on my way back from lunch, I can pick them up a cup of coffee that I know they like. So I, it, I don't know if that it's anything huge, Brian, maybe there is that I'm just not thinking of, but I think smaller kind of practical things can just show people that you really care about them and a way to sort of put your, your day, your time, a little bit underneath another person's, you know, for a period of time. Yes, ma'am. If your full-time career is uh, ministry, sure. full-time servanthood, basically, um, can you speak to the, the boundaries, the healthy hmm. boundaries, and, and serving, your, your time is almost always yeah. serving others. So at what point do you take that time for yourself? Hmm. And mm -hmm. what, what kind of time, I, I know <clears throat> at times you don't, serve, you, you don't go to be served because you serve. Sure. So can you speak to that point, that yes, challenging point at, um, yeah. that people in ministry can have? That, that is a great question and uh, one that I have not always done well. Uh, so I would say in terms of helpful boundaries, there's probably two types of boundaries you need to have. One is sort of time boundaries and one is, I think, emotional boundaries. So just to speak to emotional boundaries uh, first, you know, student, the students that I was working with had a lot of things going on um, very often and, and some of them had broken relationships maybe with parents and so they didn't really have anybody to talk to. 
And so there were ways that I was really gracious and available to them that made me less available emotionally to my family. And that was inappropriate. That, that was not that was not inappropriate like I had an inappropriate relationship, but just I needed to prioritize my family and I needed to be emotionally available at the end of the day for my wife and my children. So that was a boundary I had to learn how to do. How much can I take on or engage with somebody in a given day that allows me to then still love my wife and my kids in the way that the Lord would want me to? Uh, and then the time boundaries, I, I think... What I tried to do, um, or what, and what I still try to do, is if there's an emergency, I will respond no matter what. But I learned to say, for example, with college students, I said, listen, after about 5.30 at night, unless we have an event at night, you can call me, text me, email me, anything you need to do, but I'm only going to answer a phone call. And, and what I'm actually probably going to do is let it go to voicemail, and then I'm going to listen to the voicemail, and if it's urgent, I'm going to get right back to you, and if it's not, I'm going to wait till the next day. Because uh, certainly with college students, you know, it, it's two in the morning and they think something's really important, but that's just because their day's just getting started. You know, it's not actually that important. <laughs> and, I, and I think working now with business professionals, I think uh, most of the men and women that I work with, uh, fortunately, are, you know, much more mature, stable. But I still think that for me, you know, it just would be easy for ministry to kind of take over my whole life. And when I find myself like dreaming about my work or, you know, laying awake at night trying to come up with something, that, that can be normal. We have challenges at work in all of our careers. Uh, but for me, sometimes I go, okay, I need to do this differently. So what I've tried to do is when I first get into the office, I sit down at my desk, and before I do anything, I just spend a couple minutes praying over my day, praying for my coworkers, but also I specifically pray for my desk, my laptop, and my chair, because I'm going to spend a lot of time sitting right there, and I just say to the Lord, like, help me to use my time well, to be focused, you know, to honor you and all the emails I send, all the things that I'm doing, uh, and do that in a way that has boundaries and, and is helpful. Yeah. We have time for one last quick question. Who might that be? Wilton? I want to just speak to the comment you had a few minutes ago from serving food and having serving food. Sure. Uh, I know that when I go to the nursing homes and have mm-hmm. pass, these little ladies are so excited to get a hug. Yeah. yeah. Very, you know, even at church on Sunday mornings, the older folks don't get hugs enough. Mm-hmm. And they need to know somebody loves them. They need to be felt that, that you need to let them know that you feel full. Yeah. And so that's a sort of nature. It doesn't take much to do it. Mm-hmm. And just let them know how much you love them. Yeah. Sorry. No, that's Thanks, Will. Jordan, thank you. Yeah, thank Excellent. you very much.